Hello and welcome to India Business Hour. I'm Arundhati Ramlin and these are the top headlines that we're tracking for you this evening. RBI Governor Shaktikanta Das says that headline inflation, which gives 46% weightage to food prices, matters as people understand that, says there is a need to preserve the credibility of the flexible inflation targeting framework. His comments come days after CA Anantanageswaran reiterated adopting a framework that keeps volatile food prices out of the equation. The GST Council may deliberate on levying 18% GST on gateway fees earned by payment aggregators on cards transactions up to 2,000 rupees. The ball is also in the Council's court on the issue of insurance premium taxation. The Fitment Committee has recommended four options on GST exemption for health insurance premiums with potential revenue implications. Union Minister Hardeep Puri welcomes the recent decline in crude oil prices, says cost of oil is higher due to artificial scarcity. Also says recent remarks by Minister Gadkari on imposing higher tax on fossil fuels is not reflective of government policy. Relief for Bina Modi in the Godfrey Phillips family feud. Delhi High Court refuses to restrain her from voting on her appointment at the AGM on behalf of KK Modi's 48% shareholding. Rules it found no merit in plea filed by Ruchir Modi, who is Bina Modi's grandson and the son of Lalit Modi. The Board of Reliance Industries approves a one is to one bonus issue. Record date has not been announced yet. Also clears increasing authorized share capital from 15,000 crore rupees to 50,000 crore rupees. Ola Electric has been working on a three-wheeler for some time and it could be launched soon, says CEO Bhavish Agarwal. He is not too perturbed by the loss in market share, says incumbent auto majors are only half-heartedly manufacturing electric vehicles. India's skies are open for investment, says Prime Minister Modi as he meets business leaders in Singapore. India and Singapore sign agreements to bolster semiconductor manufacturing, digital technologies and skill development. Supreme Court reserves order on Delhi Chief Minister K. G. Wal's bail plea opposing his arrest by the CBI in the liquor policy case. CBI opposes the bail plea, arguing that K. G. Wal could influence witnesses in the case. SEBI employees hold a protest within its premises for over an hour. This comes after 500 employees wrote to Finance Ministry alleging toxic work culture. SEBI Top Brass claims employees are misguided by external elements to target its leadership. The chief advisor to Bangladesh government, Mohammed Yunus, says Sheikh Hasina must keep quiet and there is discomfort over the former prime minister making statements from India as India and Bangladesh must work to improve the relationship, which he says is now at a low. Those were the headlines that we're tracking for you this evening, but let's start with what was a lackluster session on the last street. The Sensex lost over 150 points and the Nifty declined by over 50 points as markets continue to consolidate. Midcaps fared better than the blue chips as the index ended in the green. Nifty Bank Index also managed to hold its head above water. On to the top story this evening, Union Minister Hardeep Puri has welcomed the recent decline in crude oil prices. Speaking to Shireen Bhan at the India Energy Transition Summit, Puri also said that cost of oil is higher due to artificial scarcity. Further, the Petroleum Minister also said that recent remarks by Minister Nitin Gadkari on imposing higher tax on fossil fuels are not reflective of government policy. Take a look. Ultimately, demand and supply. Yes. And I was very encouraged by your uh, reference just now to OPEC having decided not to undertake production cuts. Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. We had a production daily of 102 million barrels per day. Yes. They reduced their production by 5 million. I've seen statements by OPEC Plus to the effect that they will unwind those production cuts. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm on your side. If after the drop in oil prices, will they still, and I'm not tempting anybody, but I'd like to see because they've told me at a bilateral level that they will, uh, you know, unwind. There are two things that I'm interested in is, mm. there is more oil in the market available. There's no shortage of availability. The price levels are maintained essentially on account of artificial holding back. Right. If the total amount of oil which is available in the world is allowed to be available, then I think we'd be in a slightly more comfortable mm -hmm. situation. We have so far, Shireen, navigated the 
terrain reasonably well. Anyone who is in the transportation related business, whether you make roads, highways, or you do that, you want to move into cleaner fuels. Yeah. So you want to use diesel for agriculture purposes, you want to use diesel, and you want the vehicles mm -hmm. to be more that way. So I think the comment which got attention was that we will tax it out of or some, I don't yes. know. But you know what, this is all, but it took just few hours and then it, it, it was very clear. I personally, by the way, he's not the only one. A lot of people exactly. in, the, in yes. individual capacity have talked about it. But that's not government policy. RBI Governor Shaktikanta Das today defended RBI's inflation targeting framework as one of the six seminal reforms that has strengthened the Indian economy. He reiterated that the RBI's resolve to bring inflation down to the mandated 4%. Speaking at Fiki's annual banking conference, the RBI asserted that headline inflation is the metric that matters because it gives 46% weightage to food prices, which people understand. The governor's commitment to the inflation target comes on the heels of the chief economic advisor, criticizing the concept of inflation targeting first in the economic survey and then in an opinion piece in the Mint two days ago. Here's the RBI governor in defense of the inflation targeting framework. It is the headline inflation that matters. It is the headline inflation with food inflation having a weight of 46% in the headline inflation, which the people understand. With the monsoon progressing well and the healthy kharif sowing raising prospects of better harvest, there is greater optimism now that food inflation outlook could become more favorable during the course of the year. However, I must add and emphasize that we have to remain watchful of how the forces impacting inflation play out. The balance between inflation and growth is now well poised. We must successfully navigate the last mile of dis disinflation and preserve the credibility of flexible inflation targeting framework, which is a major structural reform. The best contribution that monetary policy can make for sustainable growth is to maintain price stability. That was the governor with his take on the inflation framework. But my colleague Lata Venkatesh joins us now for more. Lata, you know, if you can explain the origin of the flexible inflation targeting framework and where things currently stand. Well, the flexible inflation targeting framework was formally adopted in 2015. Uh, when the Urjit Patel committee, uh, he was then the deputy governor of the Reserve Bank, he recommended this in a report. And in 2016, it uh, came into uh, of, uh, motion. What does it say? Basically, that the Reserve Bank and the MPC, which comprises three RBI members and three external members, that MPC has the mandate to ensure that CPI inflation, consumer price, not wholesale price, other inflation, CPI inflation remains at 4% with a margin. It can go 2% higher or lower plus or minus 2% because there will always be some spikes. Now, this uh, uh, has this succeeded from 2016. Inflation has remained above 6% for the better part, barring a few months during COVID when there were supply disruptions. Inflation has worked. The inflation targeting framework has kept inflation below 6%. And this is in sharp contrast to the previous four or five years, some say 2009 to 2013, when inflation was, you know, persistently near double digits, almost 10% for four continuous years. So it seems a success. Now, pre the IT uh, framework, there was no mandate given to the Reserve Bank, but broadly it was expected to keep inflation down and also help growth. So it was not stated numerically. Now, this IT framework also has another uh, component. Every five years, it goes to Parliament to be re-endorsed because it was once passed by Parliament in 2015. Now, why this debate becomes important is the Chief Economic Advisor, Ananta Nageshwaran, both in the uh, economic survey and uh, in a piece recently, uh, in an opinion piece, has said that this IT framework needs to be questioned, in inflation targeting framework. What are we doing? We are giving Reserve Bank a target. Now, suppose food prices rise because of a crop failure, how can raising interest rates impact it? So we are giving the Reserve Bank a target for, uh, uh, you know, over which it really has no control, the causes for which it cannot control. And he also goes on to say that when there is food inflation, 
it is the government, the FISC, which steps in with whatever, you know, export bans or import, uh, you know, lowering import uh, tariffs or importing some kinds of pulses or whatever. So the FISC has a vo should have a voice in the committee. He even makes that point. He, or he, in that piece, he also says, maybe we should go back to the previous, you know, when the RBI did not have a target at all. It was called the multi-indicator approach, where the Reserve Bank was expected to pursue stable inflation, uh, good growth, you know, several targets. Maybe we should go back to that. That is the piece. So now the inflation targeting framework under the statute itself comes up for review in March 2025. Like I told you, every five years, uh, it, it is reviewed by Parliament. The market, you know, economists, uh, bond uh, uh, traders are now wondering whether this March 25 is not going to be a cosmetic review. In March 2020, when it was reviewed, it just got passed. Exactly, 4% plus or minus 2%. Now, will they change it? Will they make it 3%? Will they make it 5%? Will they say, no, no, it is not going to be headline inflation. It will only be non-food, which is called core inflation. Or will it be completely removed? All those doubts have started coming into the market. This debate is important because it, you know, clearly impacts the way interest rates will be set. Right, Lata, many thanks for taking us through those details. Now, the Board of Reliance Industries has approved the company's one-is-to-one -one bonus issue. The company has not announced a record date yet, but it has promised to deliver on the bonus before Diwali. This is the sixth time Reliance will reward shareholders with a bonus share. The board has also approved the increase in authorized share capital from 15,000 crore rupees to 50,000 crore rupees. Now, Raymond Lifestyle made a stellar debut on the bosses, listing at a premium of 93% over the base price of 1,562 rupees. The stock ended the day 5% in the red. The company was demerged from the parent company in June and will focus on apparel-related business of the group. Jewelry company PN Gudgil is all set to hit Dalal Street. The price band for the 1,100 crore rupee initial public offering has been fixed in the range of 456 to 480 rupees per share. The public issue will open for subscription on the 10th of September. On to the latest in the ongoing battle over the control of Godri Phillips India. Delhi High Court has rejected Ruchir Modi's plea to prevent Bina Modi from voting on behalf of the KK Modi Family Trust at the company's AGM tomorrow. Now, remember, Bina Modi's reappointment as managing director will be up for vote at the meeting. Ashmit Kumar is here with more details. Ashmit, what does this mean for Bina Modi? Well, a major victory coming in for Godfrey Phillips, Chairman and MD, Bina Modi. Tomorrow is the AGM. The Delhi High Court, a day before the AGM, has rejected the application filed by Lalit Modi's son that had sought to restrain her from voting in favour of her own reappointment. Uh, bear in mind, here's the context to it all. Tomorrow, September 6, is the AGM. One of the resolutions up for consideration is for her reappointment as the MD. Now, that is something that Lalit Modi's son, Ruchir Modi, had objected to before the Delhi High Court. Uh, the suit that has been filed before the Delhi High Court, among other reliefs, interim relief that had been sought is that Bina Modi should not be allowed to uh, vote on behalf uh, of the KK Modi family and their entire shareholding in favour of her own reappointment. The Delhi High Court, however, held that this application has no merit. Uh, there is no reason for entertaining this. There is no reason for grant of relief. And with that, the interim relief application that had been filed by Ruchir Modi has been rejected. So again, a huge relief coming in. The AGM can continue, number one. And number two, her resolution uh, can be taken up by, in that AGM and number three, Bina Modi uh, is permitted by the Delhi High Court to go ahead and to use the KK Modi shareholding to vote in her own favour. She can do that tomorrow. So again, big, big relief coming in uh, as far as Godfrey Phillips uh, uh, management is concerned. But bear in mind, this issue is far from over. The dispute between the brothers, that's Lalit Modi and Samir Modi against the mother, Bina Modi, continues uh, to play out in legal circles. The Delhi High Court will continue these proceedings with respect to the inheritance dispute at a later date. So for now, some relief coming in there for Bina Modi. Thank you so much for those details, Ashmit. Now, the GST Council may deliberate on a slew of important issues when it meets on the 9th of September. The issue of GST levy on gateway fees that payment aggregators earn on small transactions may be on the agenda. The Council may also discuss the tax treatment for life and health insurance premiums. Timsi Jaipuria gets us more on the GST Council meet agenda. Timsi? 
A slew of items on the agenda for GST Council when it meets on 9th of September. Let's take you through some of the key ones. The Council could clarify on whether 18% GST should be levied for card transactions below 2,000 rupees on payment aggregators such as Pine Labs, Razorpay, etc. The Council nominated fitment committees of a view that these aggregators are intermediaries and not banks or financial institutions. Thus, they are not liable for a GST exemption. Currently, these aggregators were exempt from GST on transactions below 2,000 rupees. If approved, this could mean 18% GST on these aggregators. The Council is also likely to deliberate on matter as to whether to allow sharing of GST data of taxpayers with other government departments, ministries, etc. The Council had deferred taking a decision on this in the past, seeking that this could mean a hit for the taxpayers, especially meaning a business confidential data sharing that is not acceptable by the Council then. And sources say that now the council could approve this with riders of safety and security. Sources also say that the council could clarify on participating interest in oil and gas exploration contracts. Hair Fitment Committee has suggested that any subcontracting or passing on exploration contract to a new entity is liable under GST. If approved, it could mean 18% GST with ITC. And last but not the least, Council is likely to have a heated discussion on cutting GST on life and health insurance. Council could discuss Fitment Committee's proposal to allow GST exemption for only pure term life insurance policies and reinsurances, which could mean a revenue implication of 200 crore rupees plus. For health insurance, Fitment Committee could not build a consensus and thus it has suggested four options, including a complete exemption, exemption for senior citizens and for policies up to 5 lakh rupees, or exemption to only those premiums which are paid by senior citizens, or reducing GST on all health insurance premiums to 5% with ITC. The Fitment Committee has flagged these uh, options with their potential revenue implications. It is now to be seen what all GST Council approves on 9th of September. Right, thanks for that, Timzi. Now, so how will a potential GSE levy on gateway fees when it comes to small car transactions impact payment aggregators? Ritu Singh is here to decode that. Ritu, take it away. Well, following the demonetization of 500 and 1,000 rupee notes back in 2016, the government had then decided to waive off the service tax on credit and debit card transactions of up to 2,000 rupees in order to encourage digital payments. And this is even before the GST came into being the next year in 2017. However, now my colleague Tim Zijaporia is reporting that the GST Council in its next meeting may consider imposing an 18% GST on the payment gateway fees, which is imposed by payment aggregators for facilitating online transactions between merchants and their customers. Now, this fee typically ranges between 0.5 to 2%, but you can assume that on average, this fee is roughly around 1% for the industry. Now, what is the impact if a GST of 18% is imposed on it? Well, the payment aggregators that we spoke to said that if there is a tax that is to be paid, it is very likely that that will be passed on to merchants. Now, whether merchants absorb that cost or pass it on to customers, we'll have to see but keep in mind that the bulk of these sub 2000 rupee transactions are also now done via UPI which has emerged as the most preferred route of retail digital payments where the you know fees still remain zero because UPI has zero MDR so there is no impact on payments done through UPI this is only going to impact credit and debit card digital transactions so as far as the customers are concerned the impact may be limited but for the payment aggregators it is likely that they will pass on this burden to the merchants. So we'll know more on the 9th of September. Thank you so much for those details, Ritu. Now, SEBI employees held a protest within its premises for over an hour today. This comes after 500 employees wrote to the finance ministry alleging toxic work culture. Now, the market regulator's top brass has claimed employees are misguided by external elements to target its leadership. Ola Electric founder Bhavish Agarwal has hinted at the launch of an electric three-wheeler soon. In an exclusive conversation with CNBC TV 18, Agarwal also said that he is not too perturbed by the loss in market share. He added that incumbent auto majors are only half-heartedly manufacturing electric vehicles. We are focused on building the uh, next wave of the EV journey. Uh, the others, the incumbents, like you said, Bajaj, TBS, everybody, they are finally getting into the game. And it's good to see that they are in Hindi. Mein so uh, if you remember, all of these people before our IPO were saying, Are electric, we will see where the where it goes, and this is not a real business, etc. Even now, uh, they are only half-heartedly doing it. 
Government subsidies to promote the sale of electric vehicles will soon be unnecessary. That's the word coming in from Minister for Road, Transport and Highways, Nitin Gadkari, speaking at the Bloomberg NEF Summit in New Delhi. Gadkari said that the EV market has reached a point where its growth can be driven by consumer interest rather than government support. Shares of Ease My Trip's parent company, Easy Trip Planners, gained as much as 11% after the company announced plans to foray into EV manufacturing. The company said that the board has approved the proposal to incorporate a wholly owned subsidiary to manufacture electric buses. No further details on the timeline of the incorporation or the cost to be incurred has been disclosed. Mercedes-Benz has launched the Maybach EQS 680 SUV in India at 2.25 crores, making it the second most expensive electric SUV in India. This is the first ever electric Maybach from the German car maker. The new car is built with Maybach features that distinguish itself from the standard EQS SUV. On that note, it is time for us to head into a short break. But coming up on India Business Hour, Mohammad Yunus, the chief advisor to the interim Bangladesh government, says ties with India are at a, at a low. And you can also catch all CNBC TV 18's news and updates on Facebook, X, Threads, Instagram and Geo Cinema. Welcome back. Deals on semiconductors, digital tech and an open invitation to Singapore investors to invest in India's aviation sector. Prime Minister's two-day Singapore visit could go a long way in elevating the two nations' bilateral ties. The Prime Minister held a roundtable with top CEOs of Singapore, uh, Singaporean companies including Blackstone Singapore, Temasek Holdings and Capital and Investment speaking at a business summit marking the end of his trip. Prime Minister Modi highlighted that there wasn't enough competition in the Indian aviation sector. Told investors that the Indian skies were open. Air India ka aapke saath yahan merger hona hi apne aap pe ek bahut bada kaam hua hai. Lekin ye bhi hum soche ki Bharat within India domestic air traffic ke liye hum chahte hain ki competition ki sthiti bane adhik company aaye. आज वो स्थिति नहीं है बहुत बार पूरा स्काई ओपन पड़ा है ये और मैं चाहूंगा कि आप में से जो कंपनियां उस दिशा में भी आगे आना चाहती हैं तो उसके लिए भी अवकाश है and in other news, the Supreme Court has reserved its order on Delhi Chief Minister Kejriwal's bail plea, opposing his arrest by the CBI in the liquor policy case. CBI has opposed the bail plea, arguing that Kejriwal could influence witnesses in the case. The Delhi High Court has issued a contempt notice to Wikipedia warning them that it will ask the government to block its platform in India. The court was hearing a case filed by news agency ANI claiming that Wikipedia failed to disclose information about users who allegedly added defamatory remarks about the company on the website. The alleged edit made on Wikipedia referred to the news agency as the propaganda tool of the Indian government. Andhra Pradesh and Telangana continue to face heavy rains and flooding. The Met Department has issued an orange alert for two districts and yellow alert for 10 districts in Telangana. The state government has also sought immediate assistance of 2,000 crore rupees from the central government for flood relief measures. However, the centre said that the state government did not submit the required information for the release of funds. Meanwhile, the Met Department has also predicted fresh rainfall in Andhra Pradesh as low pressure is likely to form over the Bay of Bengal and inter Serial team from the central government has visited the affected districts. And moving on, Nobel laureate and the chief advisor to the interim Bangladesh government, Mohammad Yunus, has said the country's relationship is now at a low. Speaking to the Press Trust of India, Yunus said former Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, who fled the country after protests, must stop making statements from India. Yunus said, and I quote, if India wants to keep her until the time Bangladesh wants her back, the condition would be that she has to keep quiet, end of quote. Eunice went on to say, and I quote again, sitting in India, she is speaking and giving instructions. No one likes it. It is not good for us or for India. There is discomfort regarding it, end of quote. At least 18 Palestinians have been killed in the latest attacks by Israeli forces. The military also conducted raids in West Bank, killing at least five people, including a 16-year-old boy. Meanwhile, Hamas has said that there is no need for new ceasefire proposals for Gaza. The militant group has claimed that Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu is attempting to thwart the agreement by refusing to withdraw forces from Philadelphia Corridor in southern Gaza. 
From one war-torn region to another, Russia President Putin has said that he is ready for talks with Ukraine. Speaking at a summit, he also asserted that India, China and Brazil could act as mediators in the potential peace talks. Meanwhile, at least seven people were killed in a Russian missile and drone attack on western Ukraine. Officials said that at least 40 people were injured and schools, medical facilities and city centre buildings were damaged. And staying with international news, at least four people were killed after a 14-year-old boy opened fire at a high school in Georgia. Nine other people were taken to hospitals with injuries. Georgia Bureau of Investigation has uh, said that the suspect, Colt Gray, is in custody and will be charged as an adult. Officials added that Gray had allegedly made the threats online and had included photos of guns. And with that, it is a wrap on this edition of India Business Hour. Many thanks for watching, but the news continues right here on CNBC TV 18.